Hello, beautiful people. You're listening to the Communal Table Podcast, part of Food and Wine Pro. I'm your host, Kat Kinsman, and my guest today is the marvelous Sarah Robbins, who is the Chief Operating Officer of uh, 21C, a hotel, uh, it's a chain that I have a very public obsession with. So I have a million questions for Sarah, Um, and I'm so glad she's here today. It's great to be here. Thank you. So we, my first time at a 21C, I'm just going to rehash the story for people who don't know it. Sarah's heard me tell this a million times. Um, I had a thing I really love about hotels is you can be very present. You can be very anonymous. You can be, you know, met in your emotional state, whatever you happen to be. It's a pretty vulnerable thing. Um, I had just gotten some news about my family that my, my dad was sick and my mother was having to move to a nursing home. And I was going to be in the South anyway, where they were. And I hadn't seen them for a while. And I thought like, you know what? I need to go. I need to surprise them. And, uh, you know, I'm going to see where this goes. So I had this long drive through a really, really intense rainstorm showed up at uh, their retirement community, went and had a salad with them, and then um, drove several hours back to Durham, North Carolina, and I landed at a 21C hotel. I'd sort of heard they existed. I went in and got a drink at the bar, and it was actually a version of my favorite drink, the French 75. They're calling it the I-75 because uh, it cuts on through there, and uh, had a snack, and then I, I got another drink. I'm just going to say that right up here. And I went to 21C Museums. Um, they're, well, they're, they're hotels, but they have uh, public 24-hour museums in there. And uh, you can go and be with the art um, whenever you want to, however you need to be. There are, you know, moving, there are some permanent things in places. There are some collections that move around. And I went into the video installation into a dark room with my drink, and I watched the video, and I just cried and let all the tension release and the fact that there was uh this art experience available for me in the middle of the night when I was really vulnerable and needed it was 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 huge to me um so Sarah can you talk about some of the experiences that you've maybe heard about or seen where people were interacting with your hotel in a in a way that people don't usually yeah, there's a great story. First of all, it's it's um it would be a strange word to use. Uh, delighted to hear your story because <laughs> it involves weeping in in the video gallery. But um, I the human that human connection um, when you sent that story to I think you sent me an email and shared that with me and I forwarded that to our founder Steve Wilson and he was also again weird word delighted to hear that because it's it's often um, I think in our business it's hard to necessarily reach people and particularly now when people are a little guarded with their phones and things like that and not really connecting with humans and so and if we can do it in another way it's it is really powerful and it's a it's a privilege that we have I think as part of the brand and there was one story that that I got that was from I mean it was just amazing and I I sent it to the team at our property 21c Cincinnati Mm -hmm. Um, I've stayed there too. <laughs> okay. And I and I said, just I can't imagine another hotel that gets to tell a story like this. And and um, you'll appreciate this that the the hotel before before we made it into Twenty One C Cincinnati was a single room occupancy, mm-hmm. uh, low income housing. And there was a, a woman that her father lived there, and she had not made the connection when she several years after he had passed and no longer lived there um, she made a reservation at 21c cincinnati and she thought that that the address sounded familiar but Mm -hmm. she never made the connection that that was where her father lived and of course upon coming up to the building um and he suffered from i I believe it was schizophrenia Mm -hmm. and so her visits to to see her father were troubled fraught i imagine fraught and just filled with stress and she it was when she was a teenager so this was her going to visit maybe her son in college and she said that when she um she went to the elevator and realized immediately because the tile is still present so if you'd been in the building before mm-hmm. and then saw it now it's so much of the historic components are still right, present in yeah. the building today so brought flooding back memories she got onto the elevator and then opened went to the floor where her father lived and when she opened the door oh. where his door the door to his room was which was right across apparently from the elevator instead it happened to be where we have an art vitrine on each 
on each floor. Yeah. And there was a beautiful landscape. And she said, oh, my gosh, it was." she was so incredibly moved. I mean, I, mean, I was... Talk yeah, about I can weeping. imagine. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm really, kind of tearing you know, up my, here. Actually, my, my, my face was was drenched by the time I I finished this, and she said it was so beautiful to see. Well, even though it was a really challenging visit for yeah, her, imagine. but to be back into this space, and she was visiting for good reasons. Her son, I think, was in moving into college, and that when she opened the door, that what had been filled with really negative memories for yeah. her and really tough memories, there was this beautiful landscape that was done by a a local artist in Cincinnati, and and again. I think I would use the word privilege that we're feel incredibly fortunate to be able to have that type of experience for someone. Well, I mean, the buildings are a lot of them are sort of adaptive reuse. They all these buildings used to be other things. And mm-hmm. it's in um, markets that were maybe not served by hotels in the, in the same way before. Um, the first one was well, the first one was Louisville, mm-hmm. I believe. Yeah. And I think not only were they not served necessarily by hotels, but larger brands might have passed over them. Right. Um, because they maybe just might not have been quite as dynamic. But I think particularly from an arts perspective, a lot of the markets that we go into are underserved um, in arts, maybe in that area. Now, in Cincinnati, we're fortunate that we... Oh, it's right next right to the... next C- to the CAC. But, um, and it was just nice to be an extension of that and to be able to bring that back to the people. And as you said, it's really, it is intended to be 24-7. You really put the... <laughs> the 24 into it yeah um but that's yeah it's i think it's underserved from from um maybe a boutique hotel market but then also the art component as well and really having a museum experience even in a city like nashville where mm-hmm. in that neighborhood there's no art presence and we're very delighted that somebody can just come in you know on their lunch hour and walk through and enjoy the museum and then pop back out into their day and there are things like there are old banks old you know, yeah. so you were saying that one had been in sro and it had been empty for a while yeah yeah and th- what are some of the other buildings that you have yeah banks seem to come up, come yeah. up a lot <laughs> so Durham was an old bank and in fact actually um, in, starting in Louisville Proof which is our um, the restaurant there um, the bar was where the bank was we really tried hard to keep the keep the vault because we thought that would be right. fun we were able to do that in both Lexington which was also a bank was that lockbox uh, lockbox the- yes and so that has a vault so our private dining room there is a, is a vault and then in Durham that's also a bank and um, Oklahoma Counting C- House, right? Counting, and Counting right. House, right? And um, Oklahoma City ha- was um, an old Ford Model T assembly plant. Oh wow! And so th- it has enormously large column grid that, and just ceilings that go on for days, and huge windows. Everything about it is is really big. Um, and then you have a building like Lexington, which is um, very, very small, but the tallest building in Lexington. I uh, I think that I only saw that once. I took a hard hat tour. That's right. actually. Right. Of right. it, um, so it all, all coming I th- I together. I think the bun had to come down, right? I think so. <laughs> right? Yes, it's I think not it hard did. hat ready, right? It was, yeah. Oh, you know what? No, it fit all over over mm. my bun, so that was kind that's, of a, that's awesome. a lovely treat. That's um, great. But also, Bentonville, Arkansas. Yeah, unusual. Um, play a lot of times people's eyebrows raise of Bentonville. Why? Why Bentonville? And of course, that's where Walmart's headquarters are, and we are located right off of the town square and. Kat, I, I swear I could say to you, I'll meet you on the square and you'd go there and then I'd be there and I would wave and wow. we'd find each other. <laughs> it's I've, very, I've never very been. I, yeah. It's um it's such a surprise. That market is such a surprise. I I, I really didn't know what to expect the mm-hmm. first time going there. And um the the Waltons have built a, a beautiful, beautiful museum called Crystal Bridges. And where we're situated is right where it's at the trailhead where you you can drive there as well. But um there are these amazing trails that you can both buy or walk or run um, to go that leads you down into this um, ravine where it's almost like built out of the ravine this is incredibly beautiful museum called crystal bridges and it has all american art and it's just a lovely story and it really feels like small town americana but then with your whole history of american art from yeah. you know george washington days all the way to um, contemporary art and you really are weaving through history when it's all american it's really beautifully beautifully done yeah i mean the, the I'll, I'll come back to the art because i have so many feelings of, yeah. of, about this um, let's talk though about your origins in hospitality how did you get started 
in this. You came from the restaurant side. I did. And um, I was fortunate. My my stepfather was a school teacher. And so he had summers off. And um, because of the school teachers, and they needed to work in the summer right, to help yeah. supplement that income. And he was, um, he taught sailing on Martha's Vineyard. And so I had the great fortune to be the sailing master's um, child or stepdaughter. <laughs> this sounds like the name and of a novel, <laughs> The Sailing Master's Daughter. daughter yeah. So he was up there for a summer for a summer job, and they provided housing, which you can only imagine what that was like on Martha's Vineyard. Um, and it was great. And so I had the opportunity to spend time up there. But the other fantastic part about it, not only is it a beautiful place to, to spend time, but um, if you have a heartbeat, um, yeah. you're hired. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, and especially if you can stay till, till Labor Day, then you're definitely hired. So I had I had this opportunity to work, and my first job was doing turn down um, at a Victorian inn. Mm. I put you know mints on the pillows and refresh the towels, and then I thought, well, that's interesting, but I kind of want to see more action because I didn't really get to talk to guests, and so I had the ability to go as a as a, be a breakfast server at a beautiful hotel that's still there, the Harbor View, and um, worked there. And I was bitten by the bug, and that was it. I was about fourteen years old, and I just thought, this is fantastic. I loved the fact, I think particularly because I was so young, it wasn't often that as a child you were put in a position where you could actually make someone happy and you yeah. could do something. You could you could influence an, an adult's experience. And I, I thought that was, I was really taken with that. And I just mm-hmm. thought that felt really good. I liked, I've always been attracted to any leadership roles. And, and I thought even as this young, I mean, I was a, ch- a child. That, I mean, that's a baby. <laughs> it, was, it was a baby. Yeah. And I was, oh gosh, I was working with older people too. I mean, it really, so there was all this great camaraderie that happened in the back. Um, and then I had this ability to really do something for an adult that that felt really um, powerful in a, yeah. in a good sense that it was, you were able to really shape someone's experience. So that was, I and mean, that was it. And then I, then I went to school for it and I loved the business side of it. And so I love to eat and drink. That was mm-hmm. all. That was a forever since I was really little. Yeah. Um, what kind of what school? When yeah. you say school, what is that? Um, so, well, I went to the hotel school at Cornell. So, mm-hmm. the, um, it's like an undergraduate business degree. I'm so curious. Okay, yeah. I always yeah. hear about hotels uh, school, and yeah. because I have you here, I'm going to ask these 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 questions. <laughs> Pardon my ignorance. I've always wondered what happens at hotel school. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was particularly funny being at Cornell because um, you've got people that are like in engineering and they're studying or people that are taking like biochemistry and they're like Sarah what are you studying for and I was like oh I'm studying for my food and beverage class yeah so I mean well in that I mean in that class we took we took wine tasting we um, I mean a lot of it was business related so you took everything for marketing and HR classes we took a lot of finance we took accounting yeah a lot of case studies um and then you did run a restaurant for one of the semesters. That was um, wow. What was your restaurant? Um, so my re- my restaurant was a night um, in New Orleans, and I did it with two, <laughs> two friends. I had never been to New Orleans. Oh my god! So you're yeah. just thinking like, I guess I can make gumbo. Yeah, we were like, okay, we ordered the hurricane, you know, um, the mix, mi- the mix. Oh, we the ordered, Pat O'Brien, the, the Pat O'Brien, exactly. And didn't order nearly enough. I remember we did run out. That was our that oh was our gosh. fail. Um, but it was fine. I mean, it was it was great, and I I think. If I took, it was like checked so many boxes because I love to eat, I love to drink, um, I like the people part of it, but I love then putting the numbers to that and making all of that all of that work. So um, it was just I was done for. <laughs> was, oh my gosh! Yeah. And so where did you go after school? Um, so then after school, um, I went to New York and I worked um, at Myriad Restaurant Group, which was like getting my graduate degree. Let's um, ex- okay. Yeah. So Working I for Drew. I yeah. so I know yeah. Drew pretty well. Drew yeah. Nepron, and he's I mean, he has opened some of the most notable, memorable, important restaurants in New York um he's got let's say Tribeca Grill Nobu, Nobu. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah currently I have to give a shout out to Batard because I I love it so and yeah. dear friends of mine um work with him on that um what are what are the other ones that he he's gosh he had Montrachet he had Montrachet which was just fantastic and he had when I was there there was um in the neighborhood with Layla which was Middle Mm. Eastern which was phenomenal and they had a belly dancer that came out every night at nine o'clock um so when I actually was just (laughs) true just dancing (laughs) there we go yeah um when when I was there that was when I mean he was 
he was, I mean, he was, and still, which yeah. is really fantastic when you it's see what amazing. the the longevity of being able to be that. And he's just, he's such a good operator. And I learned so many lessons that were never going to come from what I got at Cornell, as much as I loved that experience. Um, the lessons I learned from Drew were just um, immeasurable. And, and working for Marty Shapiro, who's been a Tribeca girl for a long time, and Michael oh, Bonnies, yeah, okay, yeah. David Gordon, I mean, all of those people, um, I still... I still go back and hear them in my in my head <laughs> probably more than I should. Yeah, I actually um, Pete Wells had come on um, this this podcast and sort of afterwards we were, we were talking about you know Drew and his intensely his depth of knowledge and he was saying like Drew will just say like you never put this table by the bathroom you know such and such or whatever oh. and just like oh it was you never put coat check by the door and you know and just these things that you know he gleaned over years and years yeah. of being a restaurateur. So do you remember when he first opened was it the early 80s was it in the, even in the 70s I want to say it was in the I you know I'm not sure I mean he came from Maxwell's Plum and then he opened Montrachet and I think that was in the I mean I I graduated in 95 mm -hmm. so um and Tribeca had been open for a couple of years when I when I got yeah. there and Montrachet had been open for about 10 years before so it must have been the 80s yeah and I he's that. whaled school with the celebrity partner because <laughs> like De yeah. Robert yeah. De Niro right. is a business partner of, of his as well and I think their yeah. um their offices are above uh Tribeca Grill and actually yeah, Tribeca uh, Films yeah 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 and and it's it's just it's crazy so it's I mean to be able to form part be part of the formation of that particular um, era of culture in New York. I mean, that had to be, what did, so tell me a few of the things that you learned there on the job. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, there were, there were a lot of things just in terms of running the dining room that were the practical, how to run a room, how to maximize a reservation book. Mm -hmm. um, that was, it, it was before open table. So you were doing everything manually and we were, it was at such a high volume. What was Tribeca Girl was with doing at the, at the celebrities. time with with celebrities, and so it was really managing a lot of a lot of moving parts. But the good news was, I feel fortunate that I had those had that opportunity to just focus on the floor. I didn't have to get onto TripAdvisor or Yelp or right. Open Table and respond to reviews. Those I didn't have that distraction that our our restaurant managers now have today. Yeah. I was there to deliver to the guest to train the team and to manage and really run the floor and with no other real distractions beside that that was plenty but I was also uh, yeah. really able to hyper focus on that so I think part of it was was just the rep like monet I mean it was monetizing revenue management mm -hmm. um within seating and making sure that how you built your book really depended on how many covers you were going to do that night and you were really able to maximize that and I think the fact that I had to do it by hand wow um, yeah Whereas Open Table, you know, and mm -hmm. some of the other reservation systems, do, you know, kind of do the thinking for you. I think understanding how to build the book um, was really incredibly important. And then I think the other part that I took from from Drew um, was I never felt like if I made a mistake that the, the world was going to come to an end. That's huge. And I was really young. I started out in their management training program and then was a manager. And I looked like I was about 12 years old. And Drew also had us wear um, the Tribeca Grill uniform. Because, what was that? Well, it was super sexy cat. Um, <laughs> it, was a, it was a denim shirt that was buttoned at the top with a Tribeca Grill pin and black wow. pants. And his, but the, but the message he was sending to managers and where he was coming from was, it used to be, you know, some a, a manager might have been and some very expensive suit and they would never bust a table because they didn't want to get their suit dirty that didn't really contribute a lot to teamwork on right the floor. and again Tribeca hierarchy. Girl was really really high volume and so there was not an option so putting the managers in the same uniform as the as the servers um, really sent a message to the team that I'm you know I'm no better than you and I if that table needs busing then here here I am um, it did make me often look not exactly like a manager right. so you had to have a, some other presence uh yeah to come about to, to you know show that you were the person person in charge um but what I loved about all of that so I was quite young is that there were times that I would make epic fail mistakes where a, a celebrity that I just didn't know um oh, right 
or someone would call and ask for a favor and I would I would decline a reservation and then you know maybe five minutes later this was cell phones were just about coming around right. now that you know Drew would call and say hey did you say no to so and so I'm like oh no I didn't I didn't know and he was like no problem just next time let him you know take him in he just never he he just gave you had you felt like it was a safe environment that I was free to make mistakes there was always coaching after the fact, um, and Marty Shapiro, who was the person that I really worked with the most, mimicked that, and mm -hmm. that was a really nice learning environment um, that I was able to really make a lot of mistakes without the world coming to an end. And you know, you had to improve, yeah, <laughs> and learn and each time. Um, but it was it was great, and uh, I really took a lot of my management and leadership style from that. Let's talk for a second though, about, you know, that, that high volume, like it being a super bustling, like the place to be about the management of people with really or management of customers with really high expectations and the wallet uh, to match. I know that um, entitlement can be a really, really huge thing. And especially, you know, Tribeca is probably one of the most expensive zip codes in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, there's, there's so, there was a lot of wealth uh, mm -hmm. There is now, and there was, and there was then. Yeah, yeah for sure. um, So let's talk about how you, you know, learn as a, you know, as a young person, like how to how to do that to maybe deal with people who aren't used to any kinds of no or mm -hmm. some sort of or, or not having things exactly how they how you want. How do you yeah. how do you do that, and how do you take the ego out of it? Yeah, I think um, it was actually a blessing in some ways because I think a lot of times you can get you can spend more energy, useless energy of telling a guest no or, or framing um, what the rules are. And there were a lot of rules. You had confirmations and, you know, you could mm -hmm. be you could be that way. Um, we can't I mean, we can't be we can't require people confirm their reservations or they lose right. their reservations. And that's the way it was then. Um, if, the, if they didn't confirm it, we rebooked the table, which mm -hmm. I mean, we couldn't any more get by with that in Louisville, Kentucky or any of our right. other markets than anything. <laughs> so, but what was interesting is that I, and I fell prey to this, that I found myself really, and especially because I was trying to do such a good job and I was a new manager, I really wanted to follow the rules. And if, if you know, in that case, I would say, well, they, the guests didn't reconfirm, you didn't reconfirm when we've rebooked your table. And I thought, at the end, I'm going to ultimately, that guest is going to get what they want mm -hmm. for all the reasons that you mentioned. And I just expended a lot of energy, and I really was no better for it. And I thought, gosh, wouldn't it just be easier if I just said yes and moved on? <laughs> and so that that also really shaped how um, how I lead and 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 what um, I really encourage our leaders to to look at today at 21C that it's, it's like just say yes and we'll figure out a way to do it. Yeah. But don't you're you're stressing yourself out and you're really making the customer angry. Okay. Right. So we're not taking care of our guests just for starters. But the other part of it was that you know what did that do to you? Um, mm -hmm. That was really negative and I just thought okay I'm going to let go of that and and uh, David Gordon um, I remember. <laughs> I remember I would go to him I'm like, but David, you know, this wine wasn't corked, you know, it, we shouldn't take it off the check. And he would just look at me as, as just as pragmatic as could possibly be. And he was like, Sarah, I'm not asking you to pay for it out of your own pocket. Just take it off the check. What are you doing? You know, and so <laughs> there was that good life lesson. Right. But again, as I loved Cornell and that program was phenomenal. I'm a huge, huge um, advocate for it. But it was those life lessons where I thought I'm I'm like chasing my own tail here, and I'm really making the guest unhappy, but I'm also making myself miserable in the meantime. And um, it, life's too short; just let it go and say yes and be done with it. Yeah, you, you focus know, on other things. I I really really like that a lot. And um, just for context, by the way, here we are uh, actually in my hotel room in Austin. <laughs> at uh, so we're actually in a hotel room um, <laughs> just at, to set the scene. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, at South by Southwest in uh in austin and we were on a just on a panel about running an empathetic uh kitchen and you were uh you mentioned on it that you you know you were young you were in new york and um you were told that you had to be meaner was it yeah. meaner or was it not as nice um, or what was just the... tougher just they thought i just that i needed to be tougher and that you know um like i would bet when i would write the schedule for the team i would take requests and i thought well if they can't work that day, then instead of everybody trading shifts, it was really hard to manage. I thought, why don't I just get a 
schedule a request book and people can ask off for when they want because they're in this business so that they can be off on Tuesday afternoon to go right. do whatever, you know, their audition, or audition <laughs> or whatever that might be. And so, um, and someone said, you should just write the schedule and they should be happy that they got a shift. <laughs> and, you know, you're bending over backwards. They thought I was um, like, uh, kowtow. I don't know. I can't think of it. Just being too overly um, permissive. And that somehow that was negative. And I thought, well, let's play this out, though. Let's say they, they can't be here on Tuesday for Tuesday night. And I put them on anyway because I disregarded their schedule request. And then they, for some reason, aren't able to trade the shift. And now they're here on Tuesday night because they want to keep their job. They don't want to be here. They're super pissed. How great is that? Are they taking care of the guests? Well, like, what's their mindset like? Yeah. And so I really looked at something as simple as how I managed the schedule, I looked at something like that as really directly impacting our hospitality and our guest experience, making sure that we had the people there when they wanted to be there. And certainly there were times that you asked, you know, okay, I need you, I need you to work, but it was yeah. a conversation and a dialogue. And it was just, I, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't see any upside to being this hard ass. And yeah. it was not in my nature. And as I said on the panel, I also probably couldn't really get away with it. I would have definitely been labeled the B word. Mm -hmm. And um, it's so which, gendered how we so <laughs> much and I not that I really would have cared. I probably at the time I, I might have cared about that more. Um, it was much less about that. And it was more about how I felt at mm -hmm. the end of the day. So yeah. yeah, the only managers who I've ever had who were like, well, you know, you need to be tougher, you need to be meaner. Like, they were just looking for an excuse to be mean to me. Yeah, I, <laughs> like, basically, I, so, right? I have never yeah. felt good about being harsher. I, and I think, like, if for some reason I am put in a position where I have to be harsh, it means I wasn't doing my job right. in the first place as a, as a manager. And, uh, you know, these the people who, you know, managed me, who, who wanted me to do that like some some wanted work taken off their plate because they wanted me to do a tough job they didn't feel like yeah. doing <laughs> in which case but also you know they had decided how I was going to be as a person and that mm -hmm. was not that's not a great way to manage yeah I just I think it has to be authentic and natural coming from you whatever your leadership style is it has to start with who and what you are um and I and I just you can just do the math like 10 percent of your team is going to do everything that you say all the time oh they're great love mm -hmm. them 10% is never going to do it whether you yell at them, whether you bake them cookies, whether <laughs> you give them the schedule that they want, what whatever. And then 80% is, you know, you, they're going to do a, whatever you put towards it. And so if if I'm going to spend I'm not going to worry about the 10% as much. I'm going to worry about that other 80% that how do I feel? They're going to either do it or not and whether I yell at them or not, it's not really going to change significantly whether they deliver. Um, and so, again, it went back to how did I want to feel at the end of the day? Um, what did I think was realistic? And I don't know, I just thought this is, I, I just, it seemed like a fight that I just didn't want to have. I thought, couldn't we just all get along I, right. like, and just be adults here? I, that was the other thing that I really took from Tribeca Girl is I think everybody was treated like an adult. They took, that mm -hmm. was their assumption until someone else proved otherwise. And other than that, you're an adult. You need, you know, when you need to be here. And they just let it go. And it wasn't like this micromanage where, you know, you're a manager with a clipboard. And so I took a lot of cues from that like, and really set the tone for how I lead today. That's really. Or how we try to lead today. Well, I'm not always successful. Uh, no. <laughs> so, and that, well, we'll talk about that in, yeah. in a second. But my, my former colleague, Sarah LeTrent, and I um, had a thing, JBCM, which means just be cool, man. Yeah, <laughs> and it's right. just you treat other people yeah. how you want to be treated. And, right. you know, losing your cool is is not a not a great thing. Um, yeah. You know, we were we were talking on this panel earlier about um, yelling mm -hmm. and how you don't want to do that. Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah, I I guess I just again, anytime we yell, you never feel great afterwards. I mean, there's certainly times where you vent, and mm -hmm. I could vent to a friend, but like yelling at someone, I don't think ever really feels fantastic even if you're like okay you got something off your chest at the end of the day you were screaming you're probably your face is really hot and red it's an uncomfortable physical it's physically terrible phys it's physically <laughs> awful feeling and so um and I just didn't see I didn't see it move the dial I mean frankly I mean I'll be 
I'll be honest, if it moved the dial and everybody was doing their job at 100%, maybe I would scream every day. But when I didn't see the results, I thought, what? This is insane. Yeah. So, I mean, there have been times where I have said, I've joked with some members of the team. I was like, I've never yelled. And one person said, well, you did, you did yell at me, but you did say, you didn't raise your voice, but you did say, this is me yelling at you. I am yelling at you, but I didn't raise, but I didn't raise, my, <laughs> didn't raise my voice. And I was like, oh yeah, I did, I did do that. But I think I can, I mean, that's like, I can count on one hand. That's yeah. not to say that I don't, um, I don't unintentionally mm-hmm. cut, cut some, like I don't unintentionally say something that we all strikes do. someone that I, but it's never, I'm never, yelling and so when you know sometimes there are times that you know on our team or you know hr is alerted that someone's been yelling or raising their voice and my line is always okay tell me about the last time i yelled at you and they probably can't give that time and so they're okay that's we don't do that like and life is too short and i'm also worried about that that individual the yeller because they that's not good for them it's just not good for them yeah it's so not great to be around it's not great and it's not great to be around um so it's just there's there's not enough time so you for stuff like that. Yeah, no, I completely <laughs> <laughs> right. agree with it. You know, I, yeah. I dated a guy who, um, he, he was quoting a friend of his once. He said, the only person who should yell at you after age 25 is your lover. <laughs> right. And I'm like, oh, actually, and ideally not too much of that. I mean, right, ideally but, not that either. But right. like, yeah, and I was thinking like, yeah, that's actually a really great yeah. way to do yeah. it. So after um, you uh, were at Myriad, is, did you go right to 21C? What were your stops? Yeah, so it was interesting because I, I left New York um, sooner than I really thought I was going to. And um, we decided to move back home to Louisville. It was back home for me, my husband. And was, I love when people say Louisville, Louisville. because I'm like, <laughs> I am like come from Kentucky, you, yeah, you say you Louisville. Do, you, do, you do a great job. Um, and so we decided, you know, I moved to New York to work, but I always said I moved to Louisville to live and that, that we just liked the idea of that that lifestyle. We were a little bit concerned about my husband's from Pennsylvania and he was not quite sure about Pennsylvania m- moving, <laughs> moving to Louisville. Just a little nervous right. about it. And um, so much so that we sublet our apartment for two years. Wow. Okay. Because we just needed a little bit of I a safety that. net of like, ah, are we really going to cut the cord? And it was funny because two years later, I think, when the lease came up, I was, I think we'd already had our first child and we looked at each other and we're like, we're going <laughs> we're nowhere. Never going. We're never, yeah. And so we finally, finally gave that up. But so I moved back home and I, but I was really fortunate because Drew and then his partner, Michael Bonadies, were doing a lot of restaurant consulting for hotels. Yeah. Um, and so they would be brought in by a hotel company that said, hey, we're really having trouble running our food and beverage outlets. We really want more of an independent restaurant feel. Can you help us? And so I did a lot of those projects and I was able to do that remotely from Louisville. And so I traveled and did openings and service training oh, wow. and helped develop some concepts for places. And I think what was fascinating about that is that you got, when you were had those in and out um, experiences, you had an opportunity to go behind the curtain, see another company's culture because you were working with them. You didn't have to stay though. And nine times out of 10, I was so thankful for that, that I thought, (laughs) okay, that I, I'm so, I I realized how, I think that was really what framed not only I knew that leadership style was really important to me and I knew what, you know, I had a great experience at Tribeca, but I also realized how important just the general culture was that that permeated throughout an yeah. entire organization. And so um, I would always play the game when I would do these jobs. I'm like, could I live here? Just that, like, could I right. live here? Yeah. Could I live here? I Not that, that I was going to move, but like, could I live here? And I like to do that when I'm traveling. And I like, what too. would it be like? And um, try that on for size. And then the other was, could I work for this organization? And, um, and why or why not? And I just used that as additional exposure mm-hmm. of, wow, I really, I would never want to work for that person or man, that's a leader that I would mm-hmm. want to work for. Um, and then tried to model behavior off of that. And then one of those consulting jobs ended up being 21C in, in Louisville. And so, um, Michael Bonnies would joke, he said, Hey man, now I've got to fly to you. So he and Drew were, were flying and helping develop that project. And what started out as a management contract with 21, what was then going to be 21C, we ended up saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. And then I, I started out, it was just going to be a few hours a week uh-huh. to help it get started. And that was, <laughs> how'd that know, end up for you? It's <laughs> like 14, almost 14 years later. Um, here we are. So yeah, that, um, I just, I was captured by the, by what was developing as the brand. That's so. a, and the fact that it has these uh, like the the owners are amazing people I, I've met I think I don't know if both but at least one of them and they are serious art collectors very yeah 
who uh, so how fashion. did that how did that come about the sort of art and hotel synthesis yeah so the original thought was they owned some they bought some old buildings louisville went through a period of downtown like a lot of small towns like or Durham, secondary Cincinnati, cities yeah. where there was the you know people moved out to the suburbs and businesses left their downtowns and then they were they were just sitting there empty empty buildings and so um laura lee brown and steve wilson the the founders bought some buildings on main street where where 21c is today not really knowing what they were going to do with them i think when they originally bought them and they were collecting a lot of contemporary art and um, their house was filled. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, the yeah. walls were, were filled. And so they, they approached the local art museum and said, wouldn't it be great if we had a contemporary branch and we could use these um, buildings to do to that? At the time, they couldn't work out the, a partnership. And so um, they got some advice from a friend and said, you know, maybe you should do something that actually produces revenue so that you're not just right. <laughs> constantly, you know, writing a check and that um, that you could have this idea that, and that maybe the art could actually help drive the hotel and drive a restaurant there. And that was how the idea was was born. And, and so um, we, Drew was and, and Michael were approached to do the restaurant. And we were going to just help conceptualize. And um, there were direct flights. And I lived there. And they were like, oh, this is, yeah, we can do this. Easy peasy. And then the rest is, the rest is history. And I think what we saw was people respond so much to the art mm-hmm. that, like, your example that you had yeah. and that was that was really moving to everyone and we just and then we started getting calls to go to other cities and people would say well we want one in our city and um that's how that's really how our development has happened to date has been pretty reactive um we always intend to be much more proactive well, i've been begging you yeah. for brooklyn for the longest <laughs> we have time. tried oh cat we have tried oh, we're the gonna like, somewhere yeah, we're like oh for five maybe on that oh, so shoot one of these days it'll it'll catch so um we'd love to be there actually so yeah i it was funny i walked into louisville and i stopped at the desk um, an artist, oh, I, I, yeah, an artist who was, uh, so my background is in, in fine art. And when I moved to New York, I worked as an artist assistant for several different people, including one where I worked a lot on, on her, her sculptures, these really intensely lifelike oh, children. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she and our de- uh, relationship developed where, you know, she would uh, do the original casts of it. And then I would sort of get rid of the seams. And then, uh, you know, by the end, I was trusted to do the underpaintings of all the skin and stuff. I walked into <gasps> Louisville and there yeah. are a bunch of these sculptures, like life-size children, like behind the front desk. Yeah. And I just... I mean, you st- must have stopped in your tracks. I, I just... I, I think I started crying. And I... Uh, and we're Facebook friends. Is this artist, yeah. uh, Judy box and I sent her a picture like oh oh my goodness right. and, and I couldn't remember if I had worked on those specific pieces or oh not oh my gosh oh I'm gonna just pretend like you did oh my gosh yeah but it was it was yeah. such a powerful thing for me and that also is one of the hotels where there's some interactive stuff too um so there's it's not just this so this is not just like paintings hanging on the wall there's interactive yeah. stuff so there is one where it's um reactive to how you are moving and it's these letters that are, are sort of falling from the sky but then they'll they'll move along with you and yeah. then can be what, manipulated and it's a poem actually oh what is what I, yeah. did, I, I didn't even realize that part yeah it's a it's a poem and um don't ask me to quote <laughs> any of that because you don't often see it in its entirety because it really is just letters it's called text rain um by camille i believe it's camille utterbach and uh she's really she was an emerging artist at the time and and now has gone on to do some really incredible work so that's been a fun part too i think just over the history is to see artists that Laurel and Steve were really drawn to early on and then watch their career take off. And if we've had any tiny small part in helping get their name out there, um, that is, that's the cherry on top. But it's just been interesting to watch a lot of them really develop and, and uh, just keep growing. There's a yeah. Wiley portrait. As I, which hotel is that in? Well, so, gosh, right now I'm trying to remember where that where those are and that and that um, was something where i i, I stood yeah. I think it was maybe in cincinnati at the time when i saw it and i, I say that's in durham but yeah, yeah. Or, or it might have been like yeah. i've gone to the various thing and yeah. and see then that he painted uh barack obama <laughs> yes later on and yeah. and to think like when i saw that that uh, you know that portrait. I heard that he was he was uh, going to be doing um, Obama's portrait, and I was thinking like I had felt such a I had stood in awe <laughs> near his his work in yeah. in one of those hotels, and it was just it, it was an astonishing thing to be able to even have just that small collection of uh, connection of of 
you know, becoming a fan just in that moment. Right. Well, and it's funny for something like that. We heard from members of the team that they loved the art that mm-hmm. was on the wall. They loved those pieces of his, um, but they didn't really realize how, I mean, and he certainly has grown in, in fame. Um, and now with Obama's portrait, it got, you know, you've watched that skyrocket. Mm-hmm. And when members of our team, like, wait a minute, that, that, Hey, Sarah, that's yeah. the guy that, just, we and that was in our hotel you know it's yeah. just interesting because it's just like that just to hear that context they just couldn't they could not believe um that that we had that artist and had several of his of his pieces so yeah it's yeah. it's so beautiful it's neat to see their reaction too oh god yeah <laughs> so and and uh the you know the art they're different uh there's some permanent pieces and then some uh you know, or move around. Yeah. Uh, but then what I really like, let's talk about vulnerability for a minute here, because um, I was thinking about that, that one that sort of the letters fall mm-hmm. from the sky and you're moving around and it's a moment where you get to play mm-hmm. and you're, so if you're staying in a hotel, um, you might be there for a billion different reasons. You yeah. might be there for a wedding or to visit family or you might be there, you know, in my case, because, uh, yeah. you know, I was worried about my, my parents, you could be, you know, just a, a thousand, um, um, you could be business or, or, um, I pro- actually, I fell in love with the one in Durham so much that I, I had stayed there. I soon after that trip, um, my husband comes from North Carolina and, uh, I actually padded in an extra day to our trip so I could bring him to that hotel oh, because so, great. so it had this powerful time. Um, but there are a billion different reasons and there, uh, and the, um, art in a lot of them, I feel like is interactive. You're in this vulnerable space. You're far from home. You're people, you may or may not be there with anybody, you know, and mm-hmm. so you might have an unguarded moment mm-hmm. with this art. I mean, is yeah. that notion built in there? I mean, I think that um, as you, I haven't really thought about it like that, Kat, but I, I think uh, I've recently rewatched Lost in Translation. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Oh, it's such a great movie. Beautiful. And there is that, that movie captures that vulnerability, I think, really yeah. beautifully. And that you ha- when you're vulnerable though that can sound like something that's maybe ne- you know potentially negative but i think it also does allow you to be open yeah to something and so um you know you i, I was saying that we you know play that game if when you go to a new city like could i live here mm-hmm. um i think lots of people do that when they travel and they try on right. perhaps a different persona there's you know there's the whole what happens in vegas right it's like that. right that's you know we all we all do and i think there's i think that's what is so romantic about traveling is that you have an opportunity to maybe be somebody else for just a little bit Mm -hmm. maybe not permanently and you want to you know that coming home is fantastic too and it's just as sweet but I think it does allow you an opportunity to be more open and particularly if you are struck by a piece that really captures your attention in some way it does ask you to it begs for more yeah often and sometimes people walk through and they they don't pay any attention we we interviewed some people in bentonville that were long time so, so those are like the road warriors they yeah. they we keep their running shoes we keep their dob kits because they Amazing. are they are traveling to walmart they come in on monday they leave on friday and we are truly their home away from home and someone made the comment they said you know i never and they've stayed there so many times and they said you know i never make time to go visit the museum, but I know it's there and I really like that. Yeah. <laughs> so even for the, you know, so I, I just want to say, oh, just once, just once. They just you need know. to grab a drink yeah, and go in the middle of the right, night. Right. But I thought that was so funny that even though they admittedly don't take advantage of it, they still were comforted knowing that it was there. I thought, oh, that's so great. And that's a special sort of like to be able to go in the middle of the night. Yeah, to, it's so there's, intimate. It, it, it really, really is. I, I felt like. You know, I, I, there were a couple other people walking through that one particular night, and I thought, like, I wonder how they found their way here. It was just, mm-hmm. a, it was just a sort of neat thing to see that that was yeah. something people, something people were voluntarily doing with their time. Yeah, I think I, I think I may have told you this, but um, you know, when we had one property, when you then move from one to two sometimes you have to tweak your rules so to speak yeah. you know of like what worked for maybe one doesn't work for for two and then it's particularly if you are going to have 10 you you do have to modify things just slightly mm-hmm. you never want it to be apparent and so one of the things that happened was in Cincinnati when um, because it was 24 7 and we always said that you know contemporary art available 24 7 and in Cincinnati um, because we're in the you know really the heart of downtown we had some some we had some um, uh, let's say so a little bit of vandalism yeah. in one of our spaces and so the team said you know 
being protective of the art, they said, you know, should we, I think maybe we should close down the gallery, say, between one and six. Can we at least shut this off? And we had a real moment to say, are we going to do that or no? Are we going to put the 24-7 and 24-7? And I'm so glad that we stuck to our guns. Yeah. It was a moment in time in the in the development of the brand of really establishing who and what we are. And we said, no, we're, you know, we that's what we can there's nothing that's it's not like we have Picassos um, <laughs> there and so in terms of from a value may they, they may be really valuable to us but there are a lot of things that we can do and we frankly do not have a lot of damage we're very very mm -hmm. fortunate that people are incredibly respective so it's not an ongoing problem that we run into but we loved the idea of like no it should be available 24 7 and yeah. We're going to put our foot down on this one, and and we never looked back um, since then. And and uh, just hearing you talk about it yeah. that way, nor will we. That, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I right appreciate on. that. Like it's comforting to me to know, even if I'm many miles away, I could yeah. always go in. <laughs> it's always right there. See, yeah. And yeah. yeah, and 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 see the art. And I think that's such a special thing. And um, we were also talking. So there's this thing at all of the hotels. Um, there are these pieces of movable art. Um, <laughs> They are present in all of the hotels. They are four foot tall. Uh, I think resin. Is it resin? It's, pl it's plastic. Yeah. Plastic, plastic penguins. penguins yeah. And they are. There's a flock at e <laughs> at each one, and you know, and they each hotel has a different color mm -hmm. um, of them. But you can. They don't leave leave the premises, and uh, so I imagine people try to take them. Um, but you can move them around. Um, mm -hmm. They are sometimes in the bars, sometimes in the restaurant, sometimes they show up in your shower. <laughs> Jennifer Garner recently, <laughs> on her Instagram, posted a video of yeah, her like such a trip. showering uh, the the penguin. And the thing is, that it, you know, they're they're sort of. They're easily accessible art. There's something really comforting about the weight and size of them. And I was, I hadn't really put this together until um, we were talking uh, just yesterday. Like, if you're traveling, you probably don't have your animal with you. If you have a dog or a cat or something right. like that, and you're used to having some other life form yeah. there. Um, and it's weirdly comforting to be able to pick up a penguin and bring it into your room. <laughs> yeah. And so talk to me about the emotional response that people have, have had to this thing. Yeah, that I, you think, I mean, the story that, that Steve always tells is, and we all watched it happen, that they were, the penguins were purchased as part of the permanent exhibition to remain in Louisville. The rest of, and we have a few pieces like that on each property, as you mentioned, that are permanent to that, like the Judy Fox piece and sculptures. But the penguins were just one of that. They weren't anything in particular special. We thought they were great, but they were one of, of, of several. And it was really how the public responded to that. They had, there was a playfulness mm -hmm. that I think people really gravitated towards them. And they, as Steve Weiss says, the public really chose them more than we did. <laughs> and it was just the response. So when we were, again, determining, okay, well, how do you take something from one to multiples? Where, where do we want, what carries through? Yeah. And um that was one of the few things that we said. I mean, obviously, the from a model standpoint, it was hotels and contemporary, um, contemporary art museum and and uh, you know great F and B. But that that penguin was the, the going to be the common common thread. But there's a feeling of of whimsy or that playful quality. I I love the fact that they also seem very at your service, but in a it looks like in a, a non butler. stuffy way. They do look like <laughs> a little butler. They're just there's something about them that just make people smile and. You know, we'll pe have people in our restaurants that will be, you know, they've requested them. Oh, I've requested a penguin to the table to before. To the table, yeah. It's a, <laughs> I mean, it is a real thing. And um, there's a, so it's been, I mean, that part has been really fun. And, you know, the team wears instead of name tags, they wear a little penguin pin. Um, and it's just this nice little current, I think, that runs runs through it. But um, they've been, yeah, they've been great. I, you are aware of the fact that I did remove one from the premises once, uh, with sort of semi with permission. It was one of the 21 seats, though in Lexington wasn't open yet. And, it was uh, with permission. Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, with a mutual friend of the brand. Right. And uh, we took the penguin out for tacos mm. in, in Lexington. And it yeah. was, but it felt like, it, it felt like wonderful anarchy to be able to do that, to yeah. fit the penguin into the car, because those are really quite they large. They seem to grow when you try to put them in a car, is what my experience. I'm like, this yes. was so petite. Now I'm trying to put it in a car and it feels like it's, double, it's doubled in size or something. Like, it yeah. really is. A, but I, I, I know it's so silly, but I have I get such comfort from those penguins. I, I took pictures. And it's so funny that I love them so much that people will actually, friends of mine, if they're traveling, will like tag uh, yeah. me in their pictures of, of the right. penguins or 
whatever or in other people that were like oh that person is clearly staying you know here so I'll, I'll tag Kat that in the Jennifer Garner like Instagram posts like so many people tag me in the that is uh, so great. Like, comments there is, yeah. it's such well, a- I, I, what I like about it is that the, the those cracking our group penguins did not come out of some decision that said okay we need to add something to the hotel that's instagrammable mm-hmm. I, a little part of me would die if that was how they right. came about now did they show up on instagram yes all the time and it is fine and i love that part but i love it that it was just part of the collection and then the public chose them and <laughs> celebrated them and we just let them kind of take it take it from there um i'm just glad it wasn't out of some boardroom meeting right um, that would have been really depressing but that is that is a success um in a huge way let's talk for a moment about embracing failure uh you yeah. there's a great arms up gesture can you <laughs> so let's talk about the i failed yeah the i failed um well it is uh, <laughs> it's really interesting to be in austin <laughs> in particular because austin was supposed to be the second 21c so i guess in that in that spirit it could be here in Austin that I should be throwing my arms up and saying we failed but um yeah everything happens for a reason but the the we failed part um I was I was reading um the uh the the very intellectual book um bossy pants by Tina, <laughs> by Tina Fey I had a moment when I was reading because she talked about this you know the whole tenant of of improv being yes but so uh, when I was reading when I was reading Tina's book um she talked about the tenant of of improv and that it was this idea of saying yes and yes and and that that's been a lot of the spirit of our culture as well and I thought okay that's interesting I'd never thought about it necessarily as improv and my sister-in-law who's incredibly talented um, does she had done improv for a long time and then she was using it as an application for businesses so she did a lot of consulting um, super creative she's like very left brain and right brain um, brilliant brilliant woman um, and she would use the tenets of of improv to work with companies to really try to to look at things from different lenses and just be a lot more open to ideas and change mm-hmm. and whatever they needed and so i i asked her if she ever did it in a service training format and she had she had not and she said but well you know we can let's let's play around with that and so we we brought her so she has two other partners that are also really talented and they came in and they did this improv training with us really with the idea that we're we're all here to like make your partner there are all these great tenants that really do tie so beautifully back to hospitality like make your partner look good um yes and that if you came to me i should my knee-jerk reaction needs to be yes and then i should add something to it um yes and why don't we also do this it's so all these great elements that we could use from a from a service culture perspective but the story that she talks about is that in that in improv you need to feel safe um and that you need to feel like it's okay to fail and that if you are hung up on this idea of failure you're never going to get any of the good stuff because you're you know you're listening to that stupid voice in our head that we I yeah we, we, we got t- it <laughs> where, do we t- where is the off switch um one of the guys called it ramon and he was like ramon is smoking in a corner and is like you're terrible <laughs> You're a total failure. Oh my god, um, I love that. Yeah, Ramon. And so yeah, mine is Ramona now. I'm like, ah, oh, that bitch. She's got <laughs> which she shut up already. But so Christina opens the thing with the idea of like we're gonna embrace failure because that's part of this and you have to be okay with that. And she talks about what a tightrope tightrope walker does at the circus is they get up, they make an attempt. They might slip and fall. They land in that safety net, and instead of sl- you know slinking off stage or out, you know out of the center, the spotlight is beamed on them, and they throw their hands up in the air, and the crowd goes wild, encouraging them to go try again. And that's <laughs> what she was trying to you know hit home with us in terms of doing this improv training, and then obviously then tied to hospitality and service culture. And so um, anytime during the improv training, somebody made a mistake doing you know attempting this because it's there's no rules and you just have to think on your feet that we, if we got botched up we would throw our hands in the air and say i failed and so that's become part of the 21c <laughs> culture is somebody will come to me and say hey sarah and they'll throw their hands up like i failed here's the deal <laughs> this is what we need to do but it's a, it create it does create a safe environment so that at least you know what problems you have to solve um it's a lot hard it's a lot harder to not know what the problems are you're never going to be able to solve them if it's if your team isn't coming to you and is being really open about it so that that's how that all 
tied together. It's it's good to fail, right? Yeah, definitely. And even if it doesn't feel like it in the moment. Yeah, it's... well, like all the tech firms, it's like they have huge signs like fail faster, make mistakes faster so that you get... You're trying. You're trying. And like with every action, you get a reaction. And then that reaction means either yes or no, or we need to tweak something and let's go. And it really does keep progress moving. Um, if you're terrified of failing, you're just never going to try anything new. And it's just a terrible environment to be in. So. Yeah, I, I know that that sort of uh, almost paralysis. <clears throat> yeah. I, uh, Andrew Zimmerman always says uh, analysis paralysis. And right. I, or buffet syndrome is the other thing where you're just like, so many choices. There's so many choices. I don't know. It's like with like if you every time you choose something, something is going to happen, that action reaction, mm-hmm. and then you can move on and keep keep that keep that going. So and I, I've been thinking about this a lot since we had this essay by Ashley Christensen about then redefining for yourself uh, what success looks like. So mm-hmm. what would a deeply successful guest stay look like uh, for you? Like if you're, if you're a bird's eye view of yeah. somebody's, uh, you know, their interactions with the, with the, with the team and stuff, what, do, what would that look like? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of it is just trying to meet them at their point of need and the way in, in, in the most appropriate ways that we can do that. And as you said, there are a lot of different reasons why somebody might be staying at a hotel or dining at a restaurant. It's not always a honeymoon or a celebration or an anniversary. Um, wouldn't it be fantastic if it was? And mm-hmm. I think it's really our job is to figure out um, and be mindful of that and really to pay attention to, to what the signals are and to really listen and to be really present, which, again, I think are skills that we're slowly perhaps – those muscles are not getting exercised right. enough, so you have to be really mindful of it. Um, and I guess what I, I look at um, is that if if we get the get the tools and the training to our team, that's our job. And then we turn a lot of things over to them at that point, where then it's their opportunity to really meet that guest at their at whatever hospitality looks like for them, and that can look so different for so many different people. And I think it's very important to not just one size fits all stamp that out. It's hard to do and and you're mm-hmm. not going to nail it every time. But if we're being really intentional about it, and if that's at least what the goal is, um, then I think you can really have this meaningful moment that it doesn't have to be fireworks and, and um, balloons. It's not always a bottle of champagne in someone's room that may not be really needing meeting their need at all if they're there for their father's funeral that, right. um, you know, just trying to be trying to be um, conscious of listening to yeah. the guest. I think that if somebody felt understood and heard, I can't imagine a better guest experience than than that. So I remember there, one of my very very favorite Jonathan Gold pieces was about his love for like a mid-range hotel chain and saying like, you know, he had gotten the opportunity to stay at luxury places and stuff mm-hmm. but he said he felt like he was always being watched mm-hmm. and, and it can be somewhat sterile yeah because, yeah and he was saying like you know he he <clears throat> felt the scrutiny he's like you know i knew it was for my benefit but felt the scrutiny but he really there was i wish i could remember which hotel chain it was but he mm. was saying it was somewhere uh it was in midtown manhattan and saying like for people with an expense account but you know not mm-hmm. necessarily there to be fancy but there for business but he yeah. liked the anonymity, the being left alone yeah. during that. I imagine for some people that's the ideal state oh, is not I being fussed imagine. over. It's to yeah. be like left the hell alone. Right, the left the hell alone. Or like the, the um, you know, the Jedi type of service where you don't even realize it's there, but the next thing you know, your coffee cup has been filled. It doesn't always have to be so in your face. And it's really our job is to be able to read a guest very, very quickly. And then, again, take some type of action and then watch and listen for a reaction Mm -hmm. to know whether we got it right. And we're, you know, you, you have to make these decisions so quickly as you're sizing up a sizing up a guest and you'd hate to make an assumption incorrectly, but, um, but really listening to their response and listening to those cues, that's, that's the difference I think than just something that's programmatic. We, we don't, we don't, you know, give a script, to our team, they really are allowed to be themselves. Um, a lot of our team doesn't wear uniforms, and even as something as as that really does set the tone. Um, that if you dress them up, it's they maybe are a little bit less themselves, and maybe from the benefit of that is you feel like you have better control. The reality is they're probably taking that uniform that's like in the back of their car and they right. wear it for the fourth time that week um, <laughs> because it's their uniform. Whereas if they're wearing their own clothes, they might actually be clean, um, <laughs> pressed um, and ready to go. But I think that that component of just letting, allowing people's personality to come through, um, you know, I, when we opened Louisville, allowing a teammate to have this. So that was for a 14, 13 years ago, um, allowing 
a, you know, a server to wear uh, any sort of pier- piercings or tattoos. That was that was not, and it was definitely not done in, in Louisville. Um, but that really wasn't happening that much. Yeah. And so we just said, it's like everything is this all welcome. Like we be yourself. And we've heard that time and time again from our team of like, this is the first place I really felt like I could be myself. The guest, that's the experience that the guest wants. They don't want somebody that's been just right. scrubbed and polished and they've got their script and like okay they're just saying it they don't mean it in any way shape or form as opposed to somebody that's like hey do you need you know just paying attention to what someone's needs are like you have a cold how about we help you with that um that's those are lo- just those little things yeah one of my favorite things is if i go to somewhere sort of super high end and they're wearing the expensive suit or whatever and you see a little bit of tattoo peek out of there uh-huh. i love yeah that. you're like tell me more about that that's yeah. the person i want to get to know yeah or even to see or, or you can tell that they have taken out like their their piercing like they're they're not wearing it but you know that no, they have there. it yeah yeah because yeah. it makes me feel like okay my people or <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are, are working here um is there anything that you wish that that you would you want to talk about that we did not hit on no I think this has been yeah this has been really comprehensive so what would you tell 20 years ago Sarah um what, what would you tell her now about her career um I in terms of like what would you want her to know at that point, like she's maybe she's, you know, getting started out or, you yeah. know, like what, what would you say to her? What do you wish she had known? Um, well, I, th- I think maybe how all of these small pieces, um, ultimately are, come together to, it's like collecting, I don't know. It's like, I feel like when you're young, you've got a basket and that you're collecting tools and they come in all different shapes and sizes and that but there's but the end of it you've got this whole basket of experience of interactions with people um inspirations from people other things that you maybe i'm never i don't want to be that kind of of leader and i guess if there was if there was anything um that you know that whole thought of like everything happens for a reason um a lot of those smaller moments were more important than I really thought at the yeah. time, but it's amazing how much I do draw upon those experiences. Um, in order to go to Cornell, um, I had to—I I had an ROTC scholarship, and so I wanted to go to that hotel school so desperately right. that I was willing to wear combat boots to do it. And so I applied and got a scholarship, um, and ha- then owed military service. And Kat, that was not anything that I was inherently yeah. interested in. I had no idea you did yeah. that. Yeah. So what what so, did you do in the military? Um, I was a um, ultimately retired as a captain. I was quartermaster officer. Okay, I had so, no idea. So I would have asked you so, so many questions. Yeah. Yes. So, um, I, I, it's, yeah, a little, uh, it, it was not anything that I, I did not, you know, at age eight, was I planning assaults and raids in my backyard and it just was nothing. But I thought I want to go to this school so badly. And that was the path. That yeah. was the, that was the way I was going to be able to do it. My parents were never going to be able to afford to, to send me there. And, um, I thought, well, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to figure out a way by God, some, you know, some, somehow to do it. And at the time, doing that I if somebody had asked me I would have said I'm 100% doing this for the money the joke totally became on on me that that experience of first of all doing something and the importance of doing something and then if you're going to do it do it well like yeah if you're you know if 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 it's worth doing it's worth doing well so there was that lesson that you know if you're going to spend time on something then really just really do it and be thoughtful about it and be present and, and all of those things. And the other was, um, I learned a lot of leadership. <laughs> yeah. Leadership. <laughs> so um, yeah, where's the, from that, so. the intersection of military and hospitality? I know that there's a lot built in there because I know that like, planning. The, like, well, and I know like <laughs> yeah. the, that, um, the CIA, not the government one, but the <laughs> Culinary Institute of America was, was yeah. founded to help, uh, you know, re, uh, mil- people coming back from the military learn a trade. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. there, there's there's a there yeah there's a really deep connection there for you know people coming back from wartime and they had to you know learn how to make a living outside of there and so there there really is I mean there's there's the brigade system in the kitchen which right, comes from course, way yeah. way back yeah. there that's. So how yeah. have the two informed each other? Um, I I think um well a lot of it I I have to say planning because mm-hmm. that was you you we took classes on how to plan yeah. um, that were part of the military training. And so they've got the leadership training piece down yeah. and the idea of um, a chain of command and a really clear chain of command. Uh, 
I think about that all the time of like, ah, oh, that's kind of broken because of a chain of command issue and a lack of clarity. And we try to identify those in our own organization and particularly as we've tried to scale, um, that it does, it's not always perfect. And we see where that becomes challenging and you just watch it unfold and it has nothing to do with the people themselves. It just, that's how it works yeah. from an organizational behavior perspective. So, um, I think, I think today, I mean, the lesson that I, that I learned at the time was, um, you know, it's, it's great to have something that you really want to go after and it's worth that seem, seemingly it was a sacrifice. And so that was a, that's a good lesson to learn as a young person, you know, 20, 20 years ago. Yeah. But what I draw on now more is all of the, the methodical right. training um, that, that came about that was really from a, a leadership perspective perspective like you know I think what Simon Sinek has read that you know has written the book now you know great leaders eat last well, that's a milit that's a military thing you eat last and that is there were a lot of tenants like that that were just that's how it was done period the end um Another one that I think is fantastic is, um, and that made me think of this with uh, Ashley Christensen's um, article where she was saying, you know, she felt like she had to have all the answers. Inherently, the way that the military is structured is that you have commissioned officers and then you have non-commissioned officers. And the non-commissioned officers are really the experts. They are the ones that, that is, they are the experts in that. And the commissioned officer is the person that's trying to lead and plan and get all of get all those things moving in the right mm -hmm. direction. Those are two really different skill sets. But you could be a leader of something that you don't, from a technical perspective, you have no knowledge of. That person is absolutely the expert well over you, and they have much more time in service than you do. And here you are, this young second lieutenant <laughs> that's coming out as like a platoon leader. And these people, they've been doing this for many years. Well, that happens in the hospitality business all the time. They're, you know, cooks in our kitchen that have – they. They do a much better job cooking than I do, but we each have to respect what each other's role is. And so what I loved about the military was that it taught you as a young officer all of these quick one-liners that you could say, um, so uh, private, um, tell me about that. Pretend like I know nothing about what you're doing because <laughs> you'd save face a little bit. Wow. And you say, pretend yeah. like I know nothing about what you're doing. Tell me about that. And they, you know, they would, their chest would puff up. And they're like, they, they know every single thing about how yeah. to take whatever piece of equipment apart or how to maintain it or how to clean it. And they would be able to share that with you. And you really need both of those components together to do what the military does, um, which, you know, is pretty remarkable when you think about everything that they're doing and how many people they're trying to manage towards one mission or I mean it's yeah. really pretty incredible so yeah I think that there are tons of parallels that I find all the time and that's been the biggest surprise to me you have blown my mind <laughs> I never knew <laughs> I never knew this about you this is incredible oh, you should have seen me in maternity uh <laughs> I think we're uh, gonna have to run <laughs> I think we're gonna have to run a picture because <laughs> that is that is incredible it's yeah, pretty funny so you have I ask everybody this okay. um you have well in particular, now that I know you have served our country, but you also um, take such great care in hospitality of other people. So here is where I invoke Oprah and the secret. Oh, and so yeah. uh, I really believe in um, saying things out loud that you want. Um, so the universe hears you and people listening can can hear what is something you want for yourself? What is the, the thing that you that you want? Just your selfish thing. What do you want? Wow. Um, it is true when you are in the business of hospitality and leading others that you do sometimes forget about yourself along the way. And um, I have two two boys, too, um, that are teenagers. And so there's that. Yeah. You're worried about what they need, um, too. So I guess, um, you know, the word peace comes to mind. Um, I talked about that Ramon, uh, <laughs> that voice in your, in your head, <laughs> that guy who's in the dark corner smoking a cigarette, um, telling you that you're shit. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have so much of that negative self-talk. Um, I'm normally pretty, po pretty positive and feel pretty confident. Mm -hmm. But um, I do, I, I wish that I didn't question certain things as yeah. much as I as I do and um I can grab on to things and really hang on to them and I probably need to do a better job of letting some of them go so maybe just a little bit of peace and being able to be a little bit more accepting of um how things come come to me so I love that now we're gonna move on to the speed round okay <laughs> what is your comfort food chocolate any particular kind 
Um, all the kinds. I, I just learned of a brand. Um, it's As- As- Askinosi. That's in. Um, oh, do you know of this? Sean, he's written a book. It's unbelievable. I've seen it written down. I think it's Askinosi. Yeah. yeah. I heard him speak recently. He was pretty incredible. And he's uh, out of Springfield, Missouri. Okay. Um, small town. It's delicious. Oh, okay. oh beautiful. Um, what is the last meal that you had that made you emotional? Oh, gosh. Um, wow. Um, okay. I was at uh, Barbara Lynch's, her, what was her, her um, first, her, like her flagship? Uh, third, uh, um 39, 39, yeah, it's on the park, 39 park? 19? 19, 19? Or is it, it's, it's, it's a number. <laughs> it's a number, and it's on the park. Number 19, maybe? And um, I had taken my son on college tours, and, and he, it was when he was applying, so it was, his, yeah. it was the fall of his senior year, and I sat at the bar and just had a really beautiful meal, mm-hmm. and I just allowed myself to just be really happy. Yeah. <laughs> and I was really, hard. yeah, I just thought I'm just really happy and I'm going to just take a moment and be so pleased that, you know, he's got a great opportunity and that, um, yeah, it was just a, it was a really nice moment. That's and I, you know, shed a couple of tears sitting at the bar by myself, which I do love eating by myself. It's, it's such a great of, thing. It's the greatest joy. You made yeah. yourself vulnerable in a restaurant. Yeah. That's really, yeah. really lovely. Yeah. Or maybe it's number nine. I can't remember. Yeah, it's, number it's nine. A, what is yeah, it's a like, number? It is um, a number. Yeah. Um, what is the last meal that somebody made for you in their home? Oh gosh. Yeah. Um, I, uh, had delicious cowboy eggs and, um, bacon from a really dear friend, uh, every Saturday morning. And, um, Oh, that's so nice. That's really great. Yeah. What, what are cowboy eggs? Cowboy eggs, um, sometimes that would be called toad and hole. So oh, yeah. Cut, she makes her own homemade bread and then her husband, makes um yeah the toad in the hole and then puts cheese over the top and uh then makes this bacon that has a little bit of cayenne and maple um no or brown sugar Mm -hmm. sprinkled on the top it's like baking candy and it's delicious and um people meet in their kitchen on saturday mornings and Mm. it's a pretty spectacular experience really lovely (laughs) so what uh, and this is another thing putting it out into the universe just in case this person is listening what living musician would you want to cook for and what would you cook for them Oh gosh. Well, I would I would have to say the um, the entire band Humphreys McGee um, because my family is obsessed with them and I am really uh, I like them because of the immersion therapy that my family has put me through. <laughs> so, wow! Um, <laughs> it just it was like okay, you can't beat them, join them, and now yeah, I'm about to go see them at the Ryman um, in Nashville at the oh, end wow. of this month. I'm super excited, and uh, I I mean the beginning they're a jam band, they're really great. They've just celebrated I think 20 21 years, wow. and um, my son is on a is on a mission to go to a hundred of their shows. Wow! <laughs> so so w- yeah, what would you cook for them? Um, what would I cook for them? Um, well, I got an instant pot and <gasps> cat. You know um, I love that. Yeah, and um, I think I would probably do. There was a great recipe. I think it was a Melissa Clark re- recipe. In She's the, good. In Girl's the, good in the Times, and uh, and that's what I've I've made that probably multiple times because my other son is like it, it's also like meat candy. I'm, I like sweet things, <laughs> um, so I think that's probably what I would make, and then we just chill out and have some beers. That sounds really nice. Yeah. <laughs> And the final question, you have five uninterrupted minutes for self-care. What do you do? Take a hike. Really? <laughs> Even if it was five minutes. Right. You'd just be outside and get, get some sunlight. I learned from Andy and Sarah that that's actually called, I think they called it forest bathing. Yeah, I was wondering. Is that a thing? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a thing. It's, I, I hadn't, I, I had heard yeah. forest bathing. I didn't know what it meant. And <laughs> they, It is forest bathing, though, when you think about it. It's like being, oh, it's just the greatest feeling. I like, I, I like, I try to hike every Sunday. That sounds like a really lovely thing yeah, to do. That's great. Oh my gosh! Well, thank you so much to, uh, to our guest today, Sarah Robbins, and you can find her. What are your socials? Oh um, gosh, Kat, I'm terrible. Yeah. Well, they're gonna be. <laughs> it's like, I think it's like SB Robbins somewhere. or something. But yeah, it'll, it'll SB be, Robbins KY, I think, and yeah. on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah, and you can find Twenty One C at uh, all the different pla- media platforms and stuff. And you should just yeah. go and visit one and like snuggle with oh, a penguin. Please do. Yeah, and, uh, and and yeah, just do it. It's a good time. <laughs> and, uh, sorry, I'm going to like, I'm going to back up that for a second. I just fumbled. <laughs> like, so you can, and you can follow 21C on, do you remember the handle for that? If not, we're just going to put it in the episode. We're going to put it in the episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, go 
don't just stay with in one and snuggle with a penguin. Um, thank you so much to our producers, uh, Jennifer Martnick, Alicia Cabral, and Amy Frank. Thank you to Douglas Wagner for our delightful theme song. If you like what you heard, please tell a friend, write a review, or rate us. If there is something you'd like us to talk about or a guest you'd like to hear more from, please let us know. You can find me on Twitter at Kitten with a Whip. Find out more about the show and catch up on all of the episodes at foodandwine.com and at Food and Wine's YouTube page. Thank you for listening and take good care of yourself until next time. 